Revelation, Revelation uh, chapter 10. Revelation chapter 10, I've got so much teaching to do that I couldn't get done with if I had to. I was up studying over the past couple days in Revelation, and you know what happens? I say, well, I've got to be ready for Wednesday night. I've I got to have something for the folks. You know, I've got to have something that's fresh, and you know, I've got to go a little deeper, go a little longer. So I just get in there and get to study, and I get to making notes, and my legal pad just keeps, the page just keeps getting turned. And then I realize, wait a minute. I couldn't teach all that if I had three nights. I mean, what in the world? So <laughs> I gotta, I gotta kind of condense some of it because I get excited about it. I want you to, I want you to learn something tonight, and I want you to be excited about it. And I want to give you just a timeline here, really, really quickly, if I can. The timeline is that the tribulation period is that time from when God raptures His church out to when the day of the Lord, that great judgment day, when God comes back to set His kingdom up on the on the earth. Everybody understand that? And so here is the time that we're talking about. We live right here. We live between the time that Jesus died on the cross and the time that he come back for the rap, that the rapture is going to occur. Everybody's got that? So that's where we live. And so we're talking about the tribulation. And, of course, I got it really big so I can give you some talk about it. I can talk about it and fill in some stuff here. But the tribulation period is a seven-year period of time where the judgment of God will come forth on the earth and it will be a time of tribulation and a time of great judgment like there's never been known. Now, of course, this will be again after God's people have been raptured out, after we've been taken home. I always do this every Wednesday night because I want you to get this, and I want to remind the believer that we're just like Noah. We are preaching, listen, the judgment of God is coming, but it's not coming until we're safe on the ark, and then the judgment of God will show up. Everybody understand that? You get that? You put that in your mind? Don't let anybody ever tell you, oh, no, listen, now you're going to have to go out here and save your beer cans and bottles and tires because, boy, the Antichrist is coming, and you're going to need to be... Don't, don't buy into all that. Listen, we're just like Noah. We're preaching righteousness right now. We're preaching, boy, accept Jesus Christ. We're standing in the ark, I believe, with the door open seven days that God left the door open on the ark. Man, he was hollering out, y'all come on in here. Y'all come on in here. Nobody come in. But the Bible says that when God closed the door, that the judgment of God fell out of the sky. Forty days and forty nights it rained upon the earth. Now, that's where we're at. I believe we're standing here inside the ark. And the door's open, and we're shouting out, hey, come on in here, man. Don't You don't want to face the judgment of God? And I believe that when God calls us home, it'll be the same as that door shutting, and the judgment of God will come on the earth. Everybody see where I'm talking about? Everybody see where we're at? Seven years, the Bible says, will be the judgment of God on the earth. Seven years. Now, the first three and a half years will be a little bit better than the last three and a half years. The first three and a half years will be just a little bit easier in the last three and a half years. And you say, Preacher, how do you know that? Well, we're going to look about that in the next little bit. But we notice that here in the first three and a half years that we see a book that was sealed with seven seals. And God continually opens each seal. And as he opens each seal, something terrible happens. Something bad happens. The Antichrist appears. But he appears to be kind of the guy that's got all the answers. But that's the beginning of his career. That's the beginning of his ministry. And as he opens each seal, here we see more judgment, more judgment. And then when he opens the seventh seal, the final seal, inside of that has three other th things. There's seven trumpets, there's seven people, and there's seven fowls of judgment, seven bottles of judgment. Call them cups if you want to. The Bible calls them vials. They're holding the judgment of God. And now here we are, we've come all the way down here to the sixth trumpet. Now where is that sixth trumpet at? It's kind of right here in the middle. It's right here in that middle of the three and a half years. Does everybody see that? So we've kind of made it halfway to the tribulation. So you know what that tells us? Things are not going to get better things are going to get worse. Because the tribulation starts off kind of, kind of slow going, but the end of it is super judgment. It's super judgment. It's the terrible of the terrible. And here we are at this sixth trumpet. It's already sounded. The judgment of God's come forth. We're waiting on the seventh trumpet, but in between there, we've seen that angel that steps out and he puts his foot in the ocean and he puts his foot on the land and he declares with his right hand in the air, he said, this is the end of time. And boy, when he says that, guess what? The end of time is near. It is right down there, run out right here. And he's saying right now, listen, guys, God's been patient and God's been patient and God's been patient, but this is the end. 
And we began to talk about that angel that was there, that angel that stood there with his foot in the, thing, in the water and his foot on the land. And I talked to you about how that sometimes Jesus Christ in the Old Testament is referred to as an angel. And sometimes in the New Testament, he's referred to as an angel. Although we know that he's part of the Trinity and that he's part of, he's part of, of God and that he's one with God, he's broken apart sometimes and called the angel of God. Now we know that this angel stands there and he declares... The end is here. But when you see that, I tell you, it's something we ought to consider. And when these people see that, there's this sign that the end is near. Now, as bad as everybody thought this was, the end is even worse. Does everybody see that? How about when the children of Israel were in Egypt and, and Moses began to lay out the plagues of God? Every plague seemed worse, didn't it? Every plague seemed like, man, it can't get no worse than this. I mean, what in the world? It can't get no worse than this. But we notice the final plague that God brought. He killed the firstborn of all of them. Can I say that it got worse? Every time you say it couldn't get worse, it got worse. And that's where we are in the tribulation now. Here we are. We're between the sixth trumpet and the seventh trumpet. And we find that something amazing happens. And what we find is that this angel declares, the end is here. It's over with. But this angel's got a little book in his hand. Everybody remember that? It says it in the book. He's got a little book, and we're going to look at that and see what he says about this little book. Look at verse 8, if you will, and we're going to read down through verse 11, and we're going to talk about this little book for just a second that this angel had as soon as I get in light that I can read in. So where are we at here? 10, verse 8, and the Bible says, And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the, give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it, and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey, and as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many people and nations and tongues and kings. Now, people will ask, what is that little book? And, I, and I'm just going to tell you, a lot of times when we're going through the book of Revelation, I will tell you what I think they are, and I will tell you what other people think they are, but sometimes there's no definitive answer for exactly what it is. There's no, this is what it is. Unless the Bible says this is what it is, then sometimes we just don't know. But our guess on this would be that it's the book that Daniel had. Now, look at your, take your Bible, hold your finger hand there, and look at Daniel chapter 12. In Daniel chapter 12, and if you're looking for Daniel, it's at the back of the Old Testament there. In Daniel chapter 12, we want you to look at verse uh, 4, and we see that Daniel had a book. Now, everybody knows who Daniel was. Some of you may not, but Daniel was a prophet that lived in the Old Testament. And when he lived in the Old Testament, God gave him some crazy visions, some things that when he wrote them down, I know Daniel had to be thinking, what in the world does this mean? He's just writing stuff like crazy that God's told him. And he's told him a lot of things that are going to happen in the end time. He said, in the end time, this is what's going to happen, and this is what's going to happen, and this is what's going to happen. And I know that even though Daniel wanted to understand it, a lot of the things that Daniel saw, he probably could not understand. But I want you to look in Daniel chapter 12, and look at verse 4. God gives Daniel kind of a strange command here. He's telling him prophecy. He's telling him visions. He's telling Daniel, hey, look at this, look at this, write this down, write that down. And man, Daniel's just writing them down as fast as he can. But notice what he says in verse 4. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro and, incre and knowledge shall be increased. And I want you to notice what he says. He says, take this book of prophecy, take this book that I've told you, and you shut it up and you seal it up until the end time. Now, what was it that the angel said when he held up his right hand? This is the end time. And he takes a book and he gives it to John and says, John, eat this book because you must prophesy again. And so what it appears to me is that the book that the angel had had some type of prophecy in it that God wanted John to prophesy. And when you look at Daniel's book, he said, you seal that book up and that book's not to be opened until the end time. Well, we just had an angel step out in the ocean and say, this is the end, eat this book and prophesy again. So we say, could it be Daniel's book? Well, certainly it could be Daniel's book. We know this, that whatever was in the book, it was to help John as he prophesied and told the future of things that nobody knew. 
Now, we see that Daniel's book was sealed up so that nobody could have it, but we find that John is not that free. John must now prophesy about things that nobody knows. And so when you consider this, can we say for sure that the book that he ate, that the book that he would testify from was the book of Daniel? I wouldn't say that we could say for sure, but I would say this, that if he's not going to prophesy the book at the end, I don't know who will prophesy that book at the end because Daniel, of course, has long been gone. Now, I want you to look at chapter 11 of Revelation, if you will. And we'll look at the second thing that happens between the trumpet number six and the trumpet number seven. Between six and seven, two things happen. The first one we just went over, that is an angel that steps out and gives this book to John to eat. This angel that prophesies, hey, the end has come, it's over, it's done, that happens. And then the second thing happens, and uh, there's a lot of discussion on this, and this has always been kind of a neat thing to talk about and a neat thing to study, uh, whether or not we can completely understand it or not is good. It's good information to learn. I want you to look in verse 1. This same angel, the one that has his foot in the ocean and his foot on the land, the same one that's clothed in a cloud with a rainbow around him, the same one with a face that's shining like Jesus's did, the same angel that had his feet on fire just like Jesus did, this angel is still talking here in chapter, in, in chapter 11, verse 1. And notice what he says. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. Now, I want you to notice that something here has happened that John, God tells John, John, I want you to go down. This angel says, John, go down, and I want you to measure the temple of God. Now, when I say the temple, does everybody understand what I mean when I say the temple that's on the earth? Does everybody know what I mean by that? The first temple was built by who? Somebody tell me. You can tell me. Solomon. Everybody remember that? The first temple was built by Solomon. Before the temple, they worship in the what? The tabernacle. Everybody remember the tabernacle? was just a big tent. In the tent, they had to tear it down and set it up and tear it down and settle it up. And they had to carry everything around. Finally, God said, look, I don't want you toting my house around anymore. I want you to build me something. David said, I'll do it. And he said, no, not you. You can just draw it up and get it ready. My son, your son Solomon can do it. So Solomon built this temple. It was just an awesome temple. What happened to that temple? Anybody know? got destroyed. The temple was destroyed, so there's no temple anymore, right? And we know that the temple went through many things. The temple, uh, it went through disrepair and then repair, and then it was destroyed. Guess what happened? The temple was what? Rebuilt. Who rebuilt the temple? Anybody know? Who? Yes, sir. Temple was rebuilt. What happened to the temple? What happened to that temple? Destroyed again. And we find that the temple that Jesus walked in, who built that temple? Does anybody know? Herod the Great. Herod the Great built the temple that Jesus taught out of. And that was the temple that Jesus went in and threw all the tables over and did all that stuff. Remember remember that? Herod built that. Guess what happened to that temple? Destroyed. You know who destroyed it? Rome destroyed it. Rome tore it up, burned it down, said there won't be anything here. And if you watch over on the news, you'll see the Jews that are against the wall and they're wailing against the wall. Everybody know what I'm talking about? That's where the temple would have been. It would have been there. It's the only part of it that still remains is that wall. And they worship toward God at that wall, and that wall means a lot to God's people. Now, do you know what the Jewish people want right now more than they want anything? They want a temple. They want a temple. They say, man, we want a temple, a place that we should worship God, although they don't understand that all they have to do is come freely by the blood of Christ and worship right now. They don't need a temple, but they want a temple. And so we see here that John has been told by the angel, go down and measure the temple. So do you know what that means must be in in Jerusalem in this time period? A temple. There must be a temple or he couldn't measure. Does everybody, everybody see where I'm coming from? He says, listen, go down and measure the temple. Well, you know that John had lived long enough. He had seen the temple destroyed by Rome. He knew there was no temple in Jerusalem at that time. So if the angel was telling him, go and measure a temple, what he was telling him is, go measure the new temple that's there now. So you know what we ought to be looking for if we want to kind of get an idea of where this time ought to be? We ought to be looking for a temple to get built in Jerusalem. Now there's preachers and reports, and I've heard all kinds of stuff, how that everything's ready to build the temple, how that the rabbis and the Sanhedrin and those that are there in power today have already compiled the things to build the temple. There are those that say and swear that they've seen the stuff ready to build. Would I be shocked? No, I wouldn't be shocked. I believe we're that close. But you know what we do know? We know that at this time is coming when we start to see Israel build a temple. And he tells John, John, 
You go measure that temple. Go down there and look at that temple and tell me what size it is. He said, but I'm going to tell you, the Gentiles, they're going to trod that thing. They're going to run all over it for the next 42 months. Now, how long is 42 months in years? Three and a half years, Brother Glenn. I'm glad you say that because I, I, I thought that was right. I, I, I sometimes, when I throw numbers out, I'm thinking, Lord, I hope I'm right. I don't want to look dumb while I'm up here. Three and a half years. Now, you see right here what we're talking about? Three and a half years. It's going to be tread by the Gentiles. For the next three and a half years, Jerusalem will not be the Jews and it will not be the holy hill of God, but it will be desecrated by the Antichrist in this time. You realize that the Bible says that when the Antichrist shows up, that he'll be loved and everybody will love him. He'll be the guy with all the answers. But once he gets to this three and a half years, you know what he does? He goes to Jerusalem, he walks into the temple, and you know what he says? I am God, worship me here. And they begin to sacrifice, and they begin to desecrate the temple of God for the next three and a half years. You say, man, how does God react to that? Not real good. Notice what happens. I want you to see what happens. Verse 3. How does God speak, or how does he deal with these people who are going to take his temple, tried it underfoot, do all kinds of terrible things. And we could go back and we could talk about how that other Roman emperors had done the same thing and how that the Jews saw that as a sign of the end time. We talk about all that. It wouldn't matter. But I want you to see what God does. And I will give power unto my two witnesses. Now, notice the reason I believe that the angel is standing with one foot in the water and one foot on the land. The reason I feel like that's Jesus Christ is because of that statement right there. I will give power unto my two witnesses because it's the angel still talking. And they shall prophesy a thousand, two hundred, and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. Now, does anybody here know how long a thousand, two hundred, threescore days is? Three and a half years. See, Mike's quick on the calendar. He's bam, he figured that out. He said, bam, look at that. Three and a half years. So we have two witnesses that show up right here. And you know how long they're going to preach? You can say it. Three and a half years. I would put sackcloth on them, but I'm not sure what that looks like on a robe. But they'll be wearing sackcloth, and one of them apparently is taller than the other one. That's what we found here. It may be me and Brother Dusty preaching. I don't know, but it's, a, it's, it's got, he's the tall one, yes. <laughs> so we find here that two witnesses will show up, and they will preach for three and a half years. And so although their ministry is contained in this chapter, you're only going to read about their ministry in this chapter. It's like six verses, okay? That's not their full ministry. They didn't just preach for six verses. They actually preach for three and a half years. It's just summarized in this one chapter. Does everybody see that? Everybody got that? So here's what you've got to picture now. The Antichrist is ruling and reigning and doing his thing, and these two guys are preaching. Now notice what they do, and this has kind of got to be a pain to the Antichrist. It says in verse 3, these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Now, we could go into that for a long time, and we're going we're gonna to kind of paraphrase all that. So we'll go down here and see where it says in verse 5. And if any man will hurt them, talking about the two witnesses, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. Now, you've got two preachers, man. They're preaching. Just walk around preaching. And if anybody tries to hurt them, guess what happens? They burn them up with fire. Man, that's kind of rough, ain't it? That's tough. I bet the first guy messed with them, the other guy said, hey, I'm going to leave you alone, man. You just do what you want to do. Just preach on. Amen, brother. That's what he starts saying. Amen, preacher. Preach it. You don't fall asleep in their church service. Man, I mean, things are getting right. Yes, sir. They won't be having none of that dozing off during their preaching. Wake you up quick when somebody gets burned up with fire. It's Wednesday night, you know, i got to keep you all awake. Anyway, look at verse 6. It says, These have power to shut heaven, and it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood, and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. These two guys are walking around with the power to plague the earth as they feel like it needs to be done. Some responsibility. They're walking around, they're preaching, the Bible says they can stop it from raining, they can turn the water to blood, and they can plague the earth whenever they want to. It's pretty tough. Notice what it says on verse 7. When they have finished their testimony, 
The beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. Well, that's something, isn't it? But you know, the question always been, this is part that preachers like to discuss all the time, who are these two guys? Who are the witnesses are going to be? And so I'm going to give you who other people say they are and who I think they are, but can I really prove who it is? Because I really don't see a name, do you? I don't, I don't see a name. And so it may be two guys we ain't never heard of, never seen, never heard before, don't know who they are, just might be two guys. It might be me and Brother Dusty. It might be me and Brother Mike. I mean, we don't know. But he gives us a little bit here when he says a couple of things. I want you to see it. I want you to notice it just real quick. And uh, I want you to see it real quick in verse uh, number 6. Verse number 6 says, These have power to shut heaven so that rain not. So here's a witness that has the ability to stop it from raining. Now, who's the only person that we know of in the Bible that had that ability to stop the rain? Elijah. So a lot of people believe this first witness is who? Elijah. A lot of people believe that. They say, well, preacher, can you prove it? We can't prove it because it don't say it, does it? And so we can't prove that. It's just something neat to see. When you go over to 1 Kings chapter 17 and verse 1, you know what you find out? He told the king, he said, listen, king, it won't rain in this town till I tell it to rain. You know how long he didn't let it rain? Anybody know? Three and a half years. Some people would say, well, that's a coincidence. It might be. It might not be. But he said, it won't rain here for three and a half years. Well, that's some power, isn't it? Now, does everybody know how Elijah died? Somebody tell me how he died. He didn't die, did he? No, sir. He got raptured out. He jumped in a chariot of fire, and he flew out of this place. You say, why did he get raptured out? When you get to heaven, ask God, and we'll find out. I don't know. Somebody asked me one time, preacher, why did Enoch not die? Because he's Enoch. God wanted him not to die. I don't know why God didn't kill him. It doesn't say, well, he got to skip it because of, it doesn't say that. It just says he pleased God, and one day he was gone because God just took him. And you know why God did that? Because he's God and he can. That's, that's what he does. And so we find here Elijah didn't die. We find that he could stop it from raining, and he did it before for three and a half years. I want you to see something else that's important for you to know. And take your Bible, and I want you to look at Malachi, if you would, uh, chapter 4. Malachi chapter 4. Hold your place in Revelation unless you just, if you don't know where Malachi is, it's the last book of the Old Testament. Malachi chapter 4, and uh, I want you to look at verse 5 and verse 6. <clears throat> Malachi 4, verse 5 and 6. This is a prophecy of this time period. See, Malachi is over here somewhere, right? Everybody see this? He's over here in what you would almost call the dark ages of the Bible. I mean, it's a tough time. And he's over here, and he's looking forward, and God's giving him this ability to see, and he's talking about a time like right here. He's talking about a time way over here, right before God's going to come back. And notice what he says in verse 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet. Now, where is Elijah at this time in the, when this book was written? Brother Dusty's fixing to preach that teach this in Bible college. Where's, where's Elijah at? He's already been gone. He's, he's gone. So, he's, so God is promising, I'll send you Elijah. Now notice what it says. The prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, to the heart of the children to, to the fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Now here's the key here. He said, I will send you Elijah at that day, at terrible day. You see, this sometimes is called the day of the Lord, you know. People call this the day of the Lord. That's the rapture. That's not a terrible time, is it? That's a glory hallelujah. The Bible calls it looking for that blessed hope. This is the terrible day of the Lord right here. This is the terrible time when the judgment of God has come. And the Bible said, I will send Elijah in that time. Now, did people know this in the Bible? They really did. I want you to look at John with me. Look at John chapter 1. This chapter kind of confused some people when Jesus was here on the earth, when Jesus was on the earth, and we find it in John chapter 1. And I want you to look at verse 21. Everybody familiar with John the Baptist? You know who he is? He's the guy that came, the Bible says, preaching, repentance, confess your sin, be baptized. Isn't that what he said? What was his job? He said, I am here to straighten the way for Jesus. He said, I am here to say, hey guys, you better get right, you better get ready, Jesus is coming. Isn't that what he did? Now watch what the Pharisees asked him when they're standing there talking to him. Verse 21. And they asked him, 
What then? Art thou Elias? He said, He said, He saith, I am not. Art thou that prophet? And he answered, No. Now there's two people that we see that the Pharisees were looking for. Who's the two people they were looking for? Elias and that prophet that, that Moses talked about, which would be the Messiah. So they were looking for Elijah to show up, and they were looking for the Messiah to show up. And he asked him, he said, John, are you Elijah? And he said, no, I'm not Elijah. He said, are you the Messiah? And he said, nope, I'm not him either. And so here's what I want you to see, here's what I want you to get, is that the Pharisees were looking for Elijah because they had been, it had been prophesied that Elijah would show up in the end in that terrible day. Now I want you to see that that's not the day that he was looking for. This is the day that he's going to show up and they missed him. You say, preacher, does that mean that one of those witnesses, Elijah, well, I still wouldn't say it proves it fully. I wouldn't say it's a fool, but I know this. If that witness is not Elijah, he's going to show up somewhere else because he has to because God said he would near the terrible end of time. Some people say, well, preacher, I don't know if that proves anything. I want to show you something real quick. Look at verse 5 of Revelation 10. Some other reasons we think that this might be Elijah is found in verse 5. Or 11 in verse 5, I'm sorry. I got my ribbons mixed up. The Bible says, and if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth. Now, who is the most widely known prophet to call down fire from heaven? Elijah is. Everybody remember the, the, the battle on Mount Carmel where they were trying to decide, is Baal God or is God God? And that kind of sounds funny, doesn't it? Of course God's God. That's his name. Anyway, Elijah says, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll have a showdown. You put you up an altar and you call down fire from God, we'll worship your God. He said, I'll set me up an altar over here. If I call down fire, we'll worship my God. What happened? They tried all day. Couldn't ever do it, could they? What did Elijah do? Called down fire. Fire from heaven. Ate everything up. It was the fire of God. It was powerful. He won, didn't he? What happened to the 450 prophets of Baal? They took them out and they did what? Killed them. But look at Revelation 13. You know, Baal worshippers were Satan worshippers. Everybody got that? Satan left the Baal worshippers hanging, didn't they? They called down fire, called down fire, send us fire, send us fire. Guess what happened? Nothing. Satan let them down, although they were worshipping him. But now watch what happens when Satan shows up himself. Look at Revelation 13 and verse 13. He, this is talking about the beast, talking about the Antichrist, and he doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. You see, even though Satan left the Baal worshippers hanging and let them get killed in that time and made them look like false prophets, when he shows up, the Bible says he'll do great wonders and he will call fire down. And I believe the reason he'll call fire down is because those two witnesses who were preaching for this three and a half years, you know what they keep doing? They keep burning people up with fire. You know what he keeps saying? Oh, you think that's a big deal? That's no big deal. Watch me. Here's fire. You see, it's a showdown again. God's preachers and the Antichrist. Now, what happened to the 450 prophets of Baal? They got killed. But do you know what happens to these two witnesses? They get killed. They don't win this time. He calls down fire, they call down fire, but in the end, the, the witnesses die. Let me show you what happens here. Look, at, we'll go down a little bit quicker. And I want you to look at uh, what the other parts that we want to see. Look at verse 6. And we say that the one prophet is Elijah. And many people say, well, preacher, who's the second prophet? And this is probably the prophet that's more argued over than Elijah. Most people probably would say, oh, yeah, Elijah is that prophet because Elijah never died. And, of course, if you never died, you come back. And if, if the other prophet, he had to have been somebody that didn't die, so it's got to be Enoch. But, you know, we don't find anywhere in Scripture where it says that somebody has to be Enoch that, that you, if, once you uh, don't die that you, got, you, you can't die again or that you have to die again. Look at, look at Lazarus. Lazarus was raised from the dead. Guess what happened to him? He died again. You know, it's just, it just happened. So we don't see anywhere where it has to be Enoch, but some people would say it is Enoch because Enoch never died. But I want you to notice what we says in verse 6. Well, let me get to my page here. 
chapter 11, verse 6. It says that they have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. Now watch the next one. And have power over waters to turn them to blood. Now let me ask you this. Who is the only prophet we know of in the Bible that would turn water into blood? Does anybody know? Moses. And see, Moses and Elijah are probably considered the two greatest prophets of Israel. And so there's the two people that, boy, people say, it has to be Moses and Elijah. And you say, who do you think it is, preacher? Well, I would lean toward that it's Elijah and Moses. That's what I'd say. You say, well, why would you say that? Well, when, remember, remember when they were transfigured on the mountain, when, when Jesus was there with the 12 disciples? He said, you guys stay here, Peter, James, and John. Y'all go with me, and we'll go on the mountain. I'm going to show you something you ain't going to believe. I'm going to show you who I really am. And he went up on the mountain. The Bible says he was transfigured in front of them. His face began to shine like God. Who was two guys that showed up on the mountain with him? Moses and Elijah. That's who showed up on the mountain. So these two guys are on the mountain talking to Jesus. Now, what are they talking about? I mean, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> what is God, Elijah, and Moses talking about? I don't know. But it seems like they have the stamp of God, don't it? I mean, they just show up. Hey, you doing all right? Yeah, good to see you, man. Hey, you look good, man. Things are going well down here. Yeah, it's awesome. Hey, man, see you in a little bit. You know. I mean, that's, that's close to God, isn't it? I mean, that's pretty impressive. He says, I have two witnesses. I'm going to send them. I'm give them power. They're going to do all these things. Man, they're going to be able to stop it from raining. And they're going to turn water into blood. And the second part it says, and they'll be able to smite the earth with plagues anytime they want to. But we know who the plague smiter was, don't we? Moses, take that rod. He'd hit that ground. He'd raise it over this. He'd do that. Plagues come like crazy, man. Moses' old hat at it. Ain't no problem for him. He's got this. You know, I wonder about this, and this is just a verse I'll throw out here, and Brother Dusty can answer any questions you have about it. But you know, when Moses died, the devil tried to steal the body of Moses. And the Bible says that there was a big fight over it, that he wanted to take it from Michael. And Michael had to take the body of Moses, and he had to hide it. And people ask me all the time, Preacher, why in the world would he have to hide the body of Moses? I say, I got no idea. We just know that it happened. So we know that not only was Moses a big deal to God, and not only was Moses a big deal to the children of Israel, but he was a big deal to Satan. Satan wanted his body. I don't know why. Maybe so he couldn't come back and do something else. Maybe. We've got Elijah, Moses, two prophets show up, three and a half years, they're preaching, and they're burning people up. And next week we'll get into the rest of it, figure out what happens to them and do some more. And uh, so we're looking at good times here, fun um, I like to give you scripture, I like to give you truth, but if I don't know something for 100%, I'm not going to put 100% on it. I kind of give you the 80-20 and, and you figure it out sometimes kind of on your own. In the end of it all, does it really matter who the two prophets are? It doesn't. It, what matters is what they do, and that is preach the gospel while the Antichrist is preaching anti-gospel. That's their job. Their job is to be a pain in the Antichrist side the whole time he's trying to deceive the earth. That's his job. I can just see it, him up there preaching and talking about who he is and what he is and what he's doing, and all of a sudden two prophets just show up, burning people up and preaching the gospel. I can see that. I can see it happening. Anyway, how about prayer requests? Got some praises. I want to give you a praise real quick. Everybody knows Tony Stewart. Tony Stewart was in my office a little bit earlier today.